Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive and lucid presentation. I felt particularly honored to be watching you put slides up, all of which say ECB confidential on the top right corner. So okay. uh, <laughs> um, made me feel very special. Uh, did make me worry a little bit about the security of your information at the ECB, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. Um, I wonder, because it's so timely, if we could talk for a minute about Brexit. Uh, as you know, we seem to be taking this, or not we, uh, the British and the Europeans seem to be taking this down to the wire, and maybe today we'll know whether there's a, a, a deal to uh, separate the UK from the European Union. Uh, as I understand it, your forecast assumes a deal. So a couple questions. Is getting a deal going to make a difference to the European Union, to the Euro Eurozone economy? Is there going to be some, you know, everybody will feel better because there's a deal? Is it inconsequential? And uh, I'm sure you've spent the last three years thinking about what happens if there is no deal. If we don't have a deal on October 31st, does that change your outlook at all? So um, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but throughout this year, we've been, uh, the way we handled wait and see in March was we have this forecast and we have clear downside risk that is not in the forecast. But when you, you have a, a, a kind of a weakening forecast and you add in downside risk, again, uh, that's, that's essentially why we are highly vigilant in terms of monitoring the economy. So what, what do you do when you have this uncertainty about Brexit? So the decision was, uh, the baseline is there's going to be a deal. Because that's what essentially what everyone was trying to find, was find a deal. Uh, and so in the scenario where there were no deal, um, then that'd be a realization of the downside risk and we'd have to adjust our forecast. Let me emphasize, uh, so the deal itself... Uh, of course, if there is a deal, uh, there's no doubt about the ranking. Uh, a deal is better than no deal. Uh, that's a very deep insight, isn't it? So the, uh, a deal is better than no deal. So in that sense, uh, it'd be good to avoid the downside risk. But it'd be very important. And I, you know, when I was governor of Central Bank of Ireland, I'd have always been, a, I made a lot of speeches about Brexit, is even a deal is you know, a, inferior for economics to the UK never having entertained the option to leave the EU. A deal will still be quite disruptive in terms of the future labor market for the, Euro for the EU, where the mobility of people between uh, UK and the EU 27 has, I think, you know, been a very important part of the, I think, I mean, if you know Europe, you know the amount of, uh, mobility for many people between the UK and the rest of the European economy. Uh, uh, so I think that's, that's uh, for, typically when we talk about uh, trade and so on, it's trade in goods. Services, when the, when the, unless it's perfect regulatory alignment, which is not part of, the, I think, the discussion, the, the kind of nature of services trade in Europe, which is extensive, uh, will, will be fractured. So even, uh, so the kind of uh, outlook for for everyone is that a deal is very welcome, but it's in no way diminishing the fact that uh, a, a, a Europe where the UK is outside the EU is, is uh, not, not the first best from the economic point of view. Uh, I imagine if there's a deal, there's a transition period. So there isn't also even uh, these negative effects will be delayed for a while. Um, but compared to many investors have been waiting so now there is, if there is a deal, the clarity for that will mean, uh, compared to a worse scenarios, uh, the, the elimination of that uncertainty uh, will, will lead to you know, s some uh, good news, that I'm sure, for the UK economy and your area. Um, let me emphasize, though, there is an asymmetry. The UK is, I think, about 14% of EU GDP. So even really bad outcomes for the UK, for the euro area, mechanically, uh, it's, it's negative, but it's, you know, it's not, this, you know, it doesn't pass through one for one. You know, shocks to the UK do not pass through one for one to the euro area. Um, unless uh, there was a kind of a contagion effect where there's some kind of a negativity in the UK financial system led to more risk 
uh, aversion in the European financial system. But the mechanics of that, it's not super clear. That's super likely at the moment. So um, when you look at why Europe has slowed, one of the common explanations, you mentioned it and others have, have harped on it, is, oh, there's all this trade uncertainty. There's a, a slowdown in global trade. It's all Donald Trump's fault. Um, and if only that would go away, we could go back to the way things used to be. Um, but in many respects, uh, some people in Europe think of Europe as if it's a small open economy. And for a long time, Europe has benefited from the very huge appetite that China has had for European exports. As the uh, Chinese economy slows, not only because of the trade war, it seems to me that Europe has to rethink its business model. And it's not quite clear to me that the European economic leaders have figured out what that means. Uh, how do you think about this? So uh, I would uh, generally agree that regardless of the trade war, which has been very unfortunate, uh, and let me generalize it, absolutely for China, but more broadly, uh, as emerging markets, income levels go up, you know, the mechanics of convergence mean they're going to grow more slowly. On top of that, uh, as you know, there's this middle income trap hypothesis where maybe it, it's turning out in some countries where they level off is le a lower level of income than might have been expected. So there's, a, I think, a general sense that the um, uh, prospects, you know, the engine, which has been so important, especially during the crisis and afterwards, the engine of the world economy has been uh, China and more broadly the emerging world. Uh, if that engine is weaker, uh, then uh, those who've profited from exporting uh, to those countries need to have a rethink. And let me emphasize, when you look at the forecasts, we all know in the, it's in the IMF this week, there's a slowdown in world GDP. The slowdown in world trade is more intense than that, and the slowdown in uh, your area exports is more intense again. So there's a pivot because what's happening is the composition of world GDP is changing as well which is fairly obvious, that China's uh, much more focused now on uh, domestic consumption, uh, on uh, dom domestic services, uh, which, again, is a natural part and, and a, a natural uh, rebalancing of the world economy. But as you say, if one part of the world economy rebalances, other parts of the world economy have to rebalance also. And so uh, moving away from a, a, an export engine towards a domestic engine for the European economy. You know, in part, you know, ECB monetary policy has helped us. Um, but there, there, there maybe needs to be questioning. Uh, I've mentioned already, maybe there's a role for fiscal. And more broadly, uh, the perennial debate about broader European policies. Is, does, is the European policy set up in terms of innovation, uh, structural reform, um, uh, dynamism? Is a set up to deliver uh, the uh, environment in which the, the urban economy is going to perform well. So there's a large fraction of the world economy, the EU area and the EU essentially does need to have, a, I think, I agree, does need to have a, an internal assessment of um, you know, how we can develop the conditions to, um, for, for the economy to grow, to grow well. It looks like the fiscal authorities uh, learned a lesson during the crisis and they'll come and open the spigots if we have a rerun of 2008. Uh, Mario Draghi's been quite forceful in his exit interviews saying it would be nice to have a little more expansionary fiscal policy soon before we get to the crisis. Do you think there's a reasonable prospect that looking across the Eurozone that fiscal policy will loosen in time to make 2020 or 2021 stronger than they'd otherwise be? So I, I think this is a, a nuanced debate, and this is why um, it's very important to think about that debate in different ways. So first of all, it's, I think, very good news that the tail risk of a scenario where you have a big crisis, uh, if Anne was wondering, would the fiscal authorities be passive about that? The clear signal is no. They, they clearly have signaled that if there's a major crisis, they will step in. And uh, given that the fiscal balance sheets, are, you know, some of the major countries have improved quite a bit. That's credible. It's credible, having accumulated all of this fiscal space, that that kind of reserve uh, intervention power is there. 
now the debate is also, uh, which is maybe something that maybe takes a while for that debate to, to fully develop, which is uh, historically for cyclical uh, downturns, you might say monetary policy can do the job. Um, because and fiscal authority might say, well, if I try and do a fiscal expansion, and I might get it wrong, because by the time I've done the expansion, maybe the economy is recovered. Uh, I might be, the multiplier might be negated because the central bank hikes rates because they see inflation. Uh, and so basically, uh, I think uh, now the accumulating evidence is where we are now is the inflationary pressures. I'm not, I don't think they're zero, but they're sufficiently uh, moderate that I think uh, if there were fiscal expansion uh, in these current conditions, the multiplier would be quite big. And so then the question is, uh, this goes back to uh, finance ministers thinking about uh, fiscal policy as a macro tool. And, you know, you might, for academics or you know, economists, you might say, well, okay, let's flip the switch. Let's flip the switch and say, well, it's, we, we're now in that world. Uh, but given political systems, political cultures, uh, the, the process by which that analysis becomes normalized and sufficiently widespread that it, it enters the uh, decision-making, fiscal decision-making. Now, in these weeks, budgets have been set for 2020. Uh, let's see how much of that uh, gets transmitted into decision-making uh, and you know, let's see what happens next year. But I think uh, Mario Draghi and myself and the, the central banking world is basically saying, uh, look, uh, you need, if you're curious about our reaction function, our assessment is inflation is muted. Uh, with the forward guidance, you know the interest rates will only move if there's a persistent improvement in inflation. And so under those conditions, when you are trying to assess your fiscal position, uh, you can understand that the likelihood of fiscal multipliers being big uh, is, is significant. But again, all of that has been, has been nuanced, where that's a very conditional message. It's a message to those countries which are in good fiscal shape. It's not a message for taking fiscal risk uh, in those countries which are uh, you know, closer to, to the risk, risk area. You talked a lot about the effects that you think monetary policy has had to date on growth and on inflation expectations that, that you're, you think the tools have made a difference. Are you confident that you have the tools to meet your inflation target in the medium term without some big changes in fiscal policy or something else? So let me emphasize, and we always try to be crystal clear about this, is our mandate is unconditional. It doesn't say in the treaty uh, only if fiscal policy right. does its job. It's unconditional. So uh, we know our attitude is uh, we will, let me say two points. One is uh, we will continue to review but all of the instruments we do use and also instruments we haven't used to see what else uh, might, might be helpful. Uh, let me emphasize is we have a medium-term perspective. So it's not the case uh, we feel that we, we need to kind of pull out every possible instrument um, in order to get inflation back towards two super quickly. We're prepared to be patient, but it's important that the momentum is there. It, it cannot be the case that we allow a lock-in of inflation expectations at too low a level, we have to demonstrate that even if in this world it takes longer than normal, we have to make sure the momentum is there. But, you know, I think uh, we remain, uh, our assessment is it remains the case, first of all, uh, that we have more policy options. But second, it's important to emphasize is we do see inflation momentum. We see it in the labor market. Uh, we do see that, in fact, we've done so much easing. The historical pattern, which is built into our forecast, is that inflation is going to climb from where it is now towards, you know, the two-year head is 1.5. Uh, so we, we do think uh, a world where we achieve that is important. So wh where we are now is like what, one, 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 yeah, one, so, yeah, so one, going from 1 to 1 1.5 is, is a significant, I want to see that delivered. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we deliver that, then asking, well, moving from there closer towards the target, uh, 
Uh, and, you know, by the way, that, that's the forecast before we made the policy move. So is the, is the forecast going into the meeting? I think the policy move itself will uh, accelerate and strengthen the inflation dynamic. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stat next staff forecast will be in December. So as you know, there's been a lot of attention to the uh, disagreements on the governing council. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought it was time to ease, but not everybody wanted to ease in the same way. Um, uh, do you think there's a risk that that uh, very public difference of opinion shakes people's confidence that the ECB actually has the will to do whatever it takes to get inflation back? So I think, uh, again, it's a multi-level interpretation. One is, after 20 years of the euro, uh, maybe uh, there are positives to it. Maybe there's a positive to... So let's say that there was a disagreement, maybe historically in the past, but where essentially it was kept inside the governing council. It wasn't uh, as publicly rehearsed as this has been. Does that mean the disagreement didn't exist? Did that mean uh, that the kind of uh, solidity of future monetary policy was uh, uh, more secure? So, I'm not, so the one issue is disagreement. A second issue is open disagreement. And so I think that's an interesting issue about, um, I, I think, and in the end, you know, we, we uh, uh, I mean, obviously, I know the Fed is going through its review and its change is comms. But I think it's been very important that we have this pretty detailed statement after every, every monetary policy meeting, and, and then which is reinforced by the uh, press conference. And then when we publish the accounts a few weeks later, you can see the nature of the debate inside the ECB. So uh, when you get, come down to the core of it, uh, the most important message is there was general agreement we needed to act. Uh, when you have all of these unusual tools, uh, you know, I think it's natural that people have different views about the effectiveness of different instruments. Um, and we do have these very unusual uh, uh, conditions in, in the, in the in world economy. So I'm not overly bothered by the fact we, we've had this uh, high, high uh, public uh, um, discussion of, of the different instruments. But what's important, which I've tried to convey to you today, is this is not arbitrary. The decisions we made were based on very careful analysis uh, by, you know, which is really uh, a lot of work goes into making these calculations. Uh, and, you know, that's led by the ECB staff. Most of the, you know, expertise uh, in terms of what's going on is with the ECB staff. And, you know, I and the other members of the Governing Council have to take their work and study it. Uh, we remain responsible for policy making the governing council, but when uh, if you ask, well, could a different policy package? Uh, what other policy package could it deliver the same amount of monetary stimulus in a world where we already have negative interest rates? Uh, you know, if we hadn't done the asset purchase program, um, then the logic of uh, of it would have been maybe we would need to do more, say, on negative interest rates. Uh, and there's no easy choices here. Mm. So uh, I think there was a view in the U.S. not so long ago that, well, rates will be going up soon, and we don't, we'll, we'll avoid any kind of financial instability that's caused by very accommodative monetary policy and low uh, equilibrium rates of interest. Uh, now, of course, the Fed is easing. Uh, you've made clear that you're not going to tighten any time soon. You pointed out that uh, the ECB believes that negative interest rates have, have a very, haven't, haven't hurt, as some people predicted. But are you at all concerned that telling everybody that rates are going to be low for a long time, monetary policy is going to be accommodative, in some cases some of the post-crisis banking regulations are being rolled out, capital yeah. requirements are being diluted, that we're uh, taking risks to financial stability now? So I think it's a very interesting question because uh, on the one side, why are we easing? And also the market is telling us uh, is that there's a fair degree of pessimism about the future. So the, the, the classic conditions for financial instability when there's excessive optimism. So in the mid-2000s, people had, you know, this time is different, all sorts of constructed uh, fables about why it's okay to build a lot of houses and have hyper-high uh, uh, hyper loan-to-value ratios, all of that. So number one is we're not particularly seeing it. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, there's going to be people taking more risk. Uh, we always signal that now the banks are pretty heavily supervised and regulated, but the non-bank sector, maybe there's more risk. And then you have to ask, who's taking that risk? And is that risk going to be a systemic problem? So we obviously spend a lot of time, and maybe compared to the US, more of the macroprudential frameworks in place. You know, every, every month, uh, a lot of macroprudential policy in Europe is country by country. Every month, you see more and more countries putting in the safeguards, uh, whether it's countercyclical capital buffer, uh, whether it's uh, borrower-based measures for mortgages, uh, very innovative, like the, the uh, French macroprudential authority is this uh, 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 disincentive for lending to highly indebted corporates. A lot is going on to uh, ring fence those risks. But the core of it is, uh, if the question is, should you not do monetary stimulus for fear of financial stability risk, uh, I think that there's a pretty strong consensus in the economics literature is uh, that that's self-defeating. That you know, if you, if you um, don't make sure inflation goes to target, if you don't make sure the economy is stable, uh, then it's pretty high price to pay for. Interest rates are too blunt a tool for financial stability management. Having said all that, we care, we do look at it. Uh, it's obvious that if we didn't care about financial, we could you know, be much more aggressive. So we do, we do go incrementally, we do take moderate steps uh, to contain those risks. But the, the classic conditions for a lot of risk taking is not there. And by the way, we also know at this period in time, there's more, there is more indications of kind of a risk on attitude. So even the, the investor base is as not, not as gung-ho as uh, in some periods of time. So I, I guess the definition of a good European central banker is someone who can find a silver lining in a gloomy and pessimistic outlook. I really admire that. Uh, we have time for some questions. I think I'm going to take a few and we'll do. Um, uh, do we have the mics? Can we start over here with, if you would, um, it help us if you would tell us who you are and stand up, Jean, can you stand up? Tell us who you are and... Uh, Remember that to be fair to the rest of the people, it would be good if you asked a question. You um, can start, and then we'll go here. Yes, all right. please. Great school, Jacina Capital. Um, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. So I have a quick question on what set of conditions needs to be met for you to start raising interest rate to zero or above. And under the current circumstances, do you actually see an exit? Okay. In front of you, John. Jean Pizani, PIE. Um, the, the announcement at the last uh, meeting of the Governing Council that you're going to resume uh, asset purchases has drawn the attention on the limitation uh, of this policy in terms of the portfolio of sovereign bonds you can buy. So the, the, the more you go, the more you're going to buy uh, um, bonds uh, issued by high debt countries. How do you see this limitation uh, in terms of the implication for, for the effectiveness of the policy? All right. Take one more. Uh, right over here. Hi, uh, Carl Gallo. Historically, under the Bretton Woods Agreement, the, the dollar was supposed to be redeemable internationally for gold. Of course, that um, was abandoned. Uh, is there any potential in the future for a geopolitically neutral kind of Bretton Woods where every country's uh, monetary unit would be redeemable in, in gold that would actually circulate as money to create stability for, for everyone. Thank you. Why don't you start with uh, Jean's question about are you pushing up against the limits of how much you can buy of any one country's bonds, and is that a constraint? So our assessment is that uh, this did not particularly come up in September because the calculation is uh, this is not an issue for an extended period of time. So within the current limits... Uh, we think we can go for quite a long time uh, and, and buy and respect the, the principles we've always respected in terms of the, the mix of what we buy. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'm not disagreeing, you know, at some point. Uh, this goes back to the state contingent forward guidance. Uh, in the scenario we're in a situation uh, when this extended period of time concludes and we still have a problem, then, uh, then we have a I kind of have to make a new calculation. And it's clear in the pursuit of our mandate uh, what we do has to be proportional to the challenge we face. If we're in a situation when we hit those limits and we're still below target, uh, 
then we have to look at it. But there's no particular reason to take that on today. I mean, of course, everyone wants to do everything immediately. Uh, but you know, I think it's, it's proportionate to say there's a value to these limits. There's a value at, to the current limits. It's, they, were, they were put in place for good reasons. And if we hit a conflict where the limits conflict with delivery of the inflation target, then we have to see what we well, do. At the current pace of APP, are we talking years away from the limits or months? Or Yeah, so I mean, uh, it, it all, for, for the, the implementation of the APP, uh, there's a lot of tactical decisions as we move along. So it, it's not, we don't, I mean, I'm not going to give you a fixed number because it, it depends, but it's, it's, it's uh, sufficiently far in the horizon mm -hmm. that it's not something we felt we needed to, to factor into the decision in September. And, uh, you know, it's, it's well beyond a year at least. I don't want to go into uh, more detail than that. But people who say it's weeks or months, it's not true. Okay. Uh, I think you've stated pretty clearly what it'll take to raise rates. Uh, right. Sustained forecast of yeah. inflation at target. Plus, plus actual inflation being close enough. I see. So it's a double lock. So we have to project. Because people say, well, because it's interesting. You have historical periods when inflation jumps by a percentage point within a short period of time. Uh, but we're not going to, given that that's based on a history of where there's been lots of high inflation, uh, a forecast where we say, well, actually, uh, hey, presto, uh, the, <laughs> there's going to be a big jump. Uh, we're not going to have that. So it, actual inflation has to be sufficiently close towards the projection that the, the, last, the last mile, if you like, is, is credible. I'm going to uh, change the gentleman's last question a bit. So one of the ways that monetary policy works is by moving exchange rates. Obviously, uh, the euro exchange rate will move more if other central banks are not easing at the same time. Do you have any concern that if we have this global easing, that your effectiveness, your policy will be limited by the, uh, the, the inability to appreciate the euro? We don't overly focus on the exchange rate channel. So let me emphasize, I mean, it, it's hyper visible in uh, 2014. So after the whatever it takes, in 2012, there'd been a significant appreciation of the euro. So if you like, when you're in a situation in 2014 when actually you could say, actually, we think the euro's overvalued, the fact in 2014, early 2015, there was a big depreciation of the euro. So to some people say, well, that's, so QE worked through a big depreciation. But that was a very particular circumstance. Uh, in recent times, the euro's been basically flat. Uh, as we've already discussed, it's not the case we think... Uh, that the way for the European economy to recover is through kind of a, a massive uh, uh, drive in exporting. So, uh, I mean, we're focused on uh, the domestic uh, channels. It's not the exchange channel. So, I mean, I think the same and true, sure, for any large central bank is the way the exchange rate matters is primarily in a situation of some kind of unexpected, large and persistent surge in the exchange rate. Then you may want to think about it. So when it moves away from fundamentals, uh, but it, it's, it's not, under these conditions, it's, it's not, so long as the exchange rate is more or less in a pretty broad zone of being connected to fundamentals, it's not the channel. Is there any reason that we need a new Bretton Woods or a... So, so uh, let me come back. I mean, the other thing is, uh, monetary easing by us or by anyone else is good for the world economy. So I celebrate the fact more and more emerging markets are able to do monetary easing. So we see around the world, because uh, now they have more domestic currency financial systems, they're able to, to, when they have a slowdown, they're able to do easing. And the usual message is easing has positive spillovers. There might be a margin exchange rate channel, but by and large, there's positive spillovers. So easing everywhere is, is good for everyone. Uh, Peter Doyle here. Peter, can you stand up so the mic can find you? Uh, Peter Doyle, two questions, if I may. You mentioned that we should take confidence in the immediate outlook by the fact that one of the measures was the forecast with it, that it would be the inflation goes back to target. And then, uh, but I would point out that that condition has held ever since 2007 when consistently the ECB has been behind the curve. So then you emphasize the fact that you added a new condition, which is that the actual developments in inflation should also reflect some movement back to targets. So my question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that some measure of inflation is no longer falling for some period of time? 
Does it mean that it's flat for some period of time? Does it mean that it's going up by a certain percentage? The risk being, obviously, that an interpretation of that, whichever you come to, may repeat the behind-the-curve problems that we have had in the past. My second question is about the, the, the high risks in the future and what happens with them. If I recall correctly from your charts, you say that the uh, um, unconventional measures have a combined effect so far of about two percentage points effect on long yields. So my question to you is, how much is left? How much ammunition have you got left in the unconditional uh, ammunition stock to deal with any shocks that may come up? And the reason that's important is, is various, but one is that if there's not very much left, that adds to your point about the need for fiscal support. But if there is actually quite a lot left, then the fiscal authorities will say to you, you've got plenty left. We don't need to do anything. Thank you. Can you pass it to the right there? Bill Papadakis, Lombardo Dien. I have a somewhat related question. You showed how past easing measures have helped uh, the output and inflation outlook change. And anyone who looks at uh, credit growth turning from deeply negative to positive today can testify to that. But if today's source of risk is no longer a broken credit channel, but much more global conditions and uncertainty that depress demand for credit, then how exactly do you think about the effectiveness of these instruments in, in this very context? Thank you. Okay, some meaty questions there. Um, okay. You can pick and choose. Sure. Well, I'll try and get them. So the, the last one is, what's interesting, um, it's interesting how people think about the world, is we have this manufacturing slowdown. And so, so I've heard this from various well, how is monetary policy going to fix the manufacturing slowdown? Uh, I'm not saying it's going to fix the manufacturing slowdown, but um, other parts of the economy can, can uh, take up the baton. So, you know, it's the case that we still have a pretty strong services sector. Uh, we still have uh, households who are, their financial conditions are improving. So we do think, uh, you know, we're not picking and choosing about, well, which firms or which households are going to respond. And the, the kind of people who are looking to borrow today may be different to those who might have responded in different circumstances. Uh, so we, we, there's many challenges through which monetary policy works. So, and the importance of the, the different um, uh, channels uh, and you know, the different geographies, for that matter, and different industries uh, will rotate. But as you say, credit is uh, in the... It's varying across countries, but in the aggregate, credit growth is pretty solid. You know? uh, Peter's question on the uh, what's left, uh, uh, our assessment is... Uh, uh, we're, we're not at the edge, but of course we're closer to the edge than we were. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I don't have certainty about where the edge is. It's, very, it's going to be interesting. And this is why we are incremental. We're saying we're incremental. We're, not, we're going to move in small steps because let's imagine we've gone from minus 40, you know, done a much bigger short rate cut. Uh, if I, we were, you know... We could have entertained that, but I think it's safer to go in smaller steps and then check and see uh, how effective that is. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I don't think... Um, uh, I mean, the, the fiscal debate is... It, I say it's a, it's a maturing debate where the more people look at it, the more the outside world looks at it, the more we look at it, the more the people working in finance ministries look at it. Uh, you know, it's fairly striking that now that so much fiscal capital has been accumulated, after a lot of years of austerity, the, 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 the doubts about whether fiscal expansion can be counterproductive by raising risk premia. For you know, uh, important countries in Europe now, there can be no doubt. Uh, they would not see a rise in risk premia if there was a moderate fiscal expansion. Uh, they can be confident there wouldn't be an offsetting rise in monetary policy rates. So, I mean, the accumulating evidence of the power of fiscal policy is pretty strong. But we don't get in, we're not getting into a game of, a games of, of, we have to be straightforward. We call it uh, as we see it. Uh, we're saying scientifically, we think fiscal multipliers would be quite big in this scenario. But it's not the case that we condition our policy on uh, what the fiscal... But you seem to be, uh, let me rephrase what you're saying. You don't want to say we can't deliver on our objective with our monetary policy tools. 
Uh, so that's not meddling with fiscal policy. If you really couldn't meet your objectives, you could say that. But you seem to be careful not to say that. What you seem to be saying is, look, we think we can meet our objective. There's a lot of uncertainty. We have a lot of ammo left. It would be easier to meet our, uh, our objective if we had some fiscal policy and it would make our job, our life better. Yeah, and it's important to say also the, uh, it's important to ground us, because you know, in grand narratives of, you know, if you think of the grand narrative, of course, multi-policy space is less than if interest rates are a lot higher. Of course it's true. Um, but it's also the case we've seen in recent years, I mean, go back to 2014. So the, the uh, fact that there was a fair degree of success in eliminating worse outcomes from 2014 uh, to now, I think provides a strong evidence base. It doesn't carry forward to the future one for one, but this is why we're heavily emphasizing the continuous assessment mm -hmm. uh, of what's going on now. And this is why it's so important to be data-driven and evidence-based. So the fact now we have a, a really, uh, are, and because we now have so much bank-level data, we can really go into, because someone has a, may have a narrative based on a certain type of bank. I say, okay, fine, but uh, the wide distribution of banks, that particular problem is not generally true in terms of uh, the transmission mechanism. So my assessment, David, is, first of all, let me emphasize again, uh, although we can focus on the downward revisions and so on, that's a downward revision around a path that remains positive. And we are, a very important development in the last year and a half is the recovery in wage inflation. Uh, a big debate is um, how long can firms absorb that in lower profits? And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the history is they don't, they don't continually absorb them. They eventually, if the cost base is high enough, if they feel confident enough about demand conditions, they will raise prices. So, you know, our baseline, remember, our baseline is uh, inflation is, remains on an upward path. So this kind of a uh, trap situation where we're kind of trapped or something, uh, under today's conditions, I don't see it. Let's see what happens in the future, but it's important to say uh, we have momentum in the European economy, we have momentum in wage inflation, and uh, we, we, we think, and we've been quite, you know, uh, ECB's been quite creative in pushing the boundary of monetary policy, and we don't think uh, we're, we're, we're done yet if we, if we need to. Good. I think we're out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking Philip Lane. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.